Hi, I'm Buddy Ozan. I'm president of Probity Advisors. And before we get started, I'd like to thank Southern Methodist University for partnering with us to provide this three-part luncheon speaker series. So Kevin Knox and Andrea Smith, here's Kevin, Andrea, thank you all so much for the good work that you've done uh, and the help that you've given us on this project. This has just been absolutely fantastic. As a matter of fact, they deserve applause. <laughs> So while we at Probity help our clients with the financial realities of living during retirement, we've come to appreciate the fact that retirement brings with it a whole new set of opportunities and concerns, joys and stress. Yes, we've seen that there's definitely an often unanticipated mental aspect to retirement. That's why we've asked Dr. Delamontaine to talk to us today. Dr. Robert P. Delamontagne is a leading expert on retirement issues. <clears throat> he is a PhD in educational psychology. He is an entrepreneur. He's been through the exit st strategy planning process and has sold a very lucrative business, uh, 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 online education business, and he's tried retirement. He's the author of two very worthwhile books on the psychology of retirement, which are The Retiring Mind and the title of the book that's also the title of today's talk, Honey, I'm Home. Dr. Delamontaine resides in Pennsylvania during the warm months and in Florida during the cold months. He flew in from Florida yesterday, and we were fortunate enough to be able to have dinner with him last night. And one of the things that you mentioned that I was just absolutely fascinated with is the fact that he and his wife, Sherry, have actually walked uh, the Pyrenees section of El Camino in Spain. Okay, so to put that in layman's terms, what that means is about 35 miles a day, eight days in a row, over the mountains. I was absolutely stunned. He has two daughters and four grandchildren, which he says are indeed very grand. And I just want you to know there's going to be a question and answer period uh, at the end of uh, Dr. Delamontagne's uh, uh, formal presentation. So please take a card from the table. You have uh, little, what, three by eight or five by eight cards on the table and feel free to, to write down your question. Please don't add your name unless you'd like everybody to know who the crazy person was who asked that particular question. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Delamontagne. Well, thank you, buddy, and um, uh, Chris and Cinco for the, the uh, welcome. It was a real Texas welcome, as you can imagine, and I really do appreciate it. I uh, have been talking to groups about retirement, and it's somewhat of an accident that I'm, I'm here in that I had a, a circumstance happen to me after I retired, and I ended up spending a couple of years uh, studying it. And, um, and, it. and I've learned, met all kinds of people, and you know when you meet people of a certain age, when they get over a certain age, they become a little bit less inhibited, let's put it that way. And I asked this one lady if she could define retirement for me, and she said, well, she said, that's when you have twice the husband and half the money. <laughs> now, since you're here with the probity folks, I don't think you're going to have to worry about half the money. But you may have to worry about twice the husband, so we'll, we'll get into that in a little, little later. Uh, what I thought we'd do today is uh, I want to give you the lay of the land of retirement. The first thing we're going to talk about are the facts about retirement. And uh, I'd just like to give you the lay of the land of what is really going on out there right now because it's really in flux. Secondly, we're going to talk about uh, the major adjustment challenges in retirement. In other words, when I retired, I didn't know that there were adjustment re uh, requirements. Uh, not everybody goes through that. 
Well, I did. And I want to describe that for you. Uh, three, the most common mistakes made after retirement. And uh, this is something that I think is of extreme value to you. Uh, incidentally, how many people here are already retired? Okay, and how many people have not retired yet? Okay, m majority. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the psychological profile of people who are likely to have the greatest problems after retirement. I think you're going to find that fascinating. And then I'm going to talk to you about your unique personality profile. In other words, we're going to go through some things and try to cue you up to think a little bit about, about who you are and whether you are in a high-risk category or not. And then finally, uh, I'd like to take some questions and answers because sometimes it makes these types of sessions more valuable for people to uh, be able to ask questions that don't get answered during the presentation. So I, I encourage you to do that. The average retirement age is between 62 and 63. And I would think that most people in this room would think that it would be higher than that. It's not. Because a lot of people retire out of duress and hardship. And they either have physical problems, family problems, work problems. But as soon as they hit the age of 62 and they're eligible to retire, they pull the ripcord. The average length of retirement is 18 years. Now, when I retired, I, what I did is I checked the mortality tables. And I said, OK, how many more years do I have to live if I'm average? And I thought, oh, good. I have 17 years. That's the good news. The bad news is I only have 10 of them left. <laughs> so, but my wife then nudged me and said, don't worry. Your father lived till he was 94. So I'm, maybe I have a few more than that. 63-year-old men still in the workforce is 51%. 7.2 million Americans who were 65 or older were employed last year, a 67% increase from a decade ago. So you can see the demographic shift of people saying, I can't afford to retire. I'm going to work as long as I possibly can. And we're going to learn a little later why that's the case. 17% of the workforce is 65 years or older, not a very large percentage. 75% of retirees filed for Social Security benefits before the age of 66. So 75% of people take early retirement, early Social Security. The break-even age for early retirement is 77. So if you live past the age of 77, you lose money in the deal, as all these folks here from Purple, you know. Only 5% wait to collect full benefits at 66. 5%. Why? They can't afford to wait. 79 million people were born between 1946 and 1964. 79 million. So the head of Social Security, Estrue, once uh, about a year ago said that 10,000 people become eligible for Social Security every year, no, excuse me, every day for the next 20 years. So the demographic shift that's happening in America of baby boomers getting older and, and retiring and going into different life dynamics is absolutely huge. It's one of the greatest social shifts this country's ever had. 10,000 people a day become eligible for Social Security. 19% report greater tension in their marriage after retirement. <laughs> now, that doesn't come to great shock to most of the people in this room. But we're going to talk about this in much greater detail because there's a lot to, to talk about there. It's like Woody Allen once said, in my house, I'm the boss. My wife just makes all the decisions. This is another interesting statistic. One in four divorces occur with those over the age of 54. That's 25%. And it was only one in 10 in 1990. 
Now, we're going to explore that. And I have a little personal circumstance that I encountered. I was telling the group last night. I was invited uh, by CBS to go to L.A. and be on television. And um, they promoted my section, my, my segment. They gave me 20 minutes on TV during being interviewed about my book called Honey, I'm Home. They thought it was a fascinating uh, uh, topic that they thought their viewers would find just very, very interesting. So I'm, I'm there, and, and they, they send me into a, a room and they, where they do your makeup. And there was a woman there, just a lovely woman, and she had done the makeup. There were pictures of her with you know, Charlton Heston, you know, John Wayne. I mean, every, every Hollywood person that ever went on CBS, she had their picture with them on the wall. So here I am, I'm getting all queued up for this, this presentation on TV. I couldn't believe how much promotion they were giving it. And this woman said, uh, well, honey, what are you going to talk about today? I said, well, I'm going to talk about you know, uh, the problem that, that could happen after retirement with a husband and wife and how to resolve those issues. She said, oh, honey, this is LA. She said, in LA, they just get divorced. <laughs> So I didn't go into my, my presentation with the greatest sense of confidence that this was going to be a, a real stellar pre, uh, performance. But, but it was, when I look back on it, it, it was really funny. And as a result of the number of books that were sold, it was absolutely, totally true. Completely, totally true. So there's a whole issue there, and um, we're going to get into that in some detail. Only 13% are confident of having saved enough money for retirement. Two-thirds of all the people that retire have less than one year's salary. To me, that's just stunning. Think about the implications and the, de the decision-making that had gone on in that life, those lifetimes to be in a position where they had one year or less of savings. Many people become preoccupied with finances and are blindsided by the need for emotional adjustment. And I'm, I'm the one. Here, here, you're looking at it. I read 50 books. I counted them on my bookshelf before I retired. Every single one of them was about finances. I could tell you what you get, get, I know what the 4% cent solution is. I know what die broke is. I know, I know about all that stuff. And so... I was really well prepared for retirement. And um, I would say financially, that is. 78% report being happier after retirement due to less stress. 22% remain unhappy. And that's a very broad uh, perspective. What they don't cut the data as is they don't cut it by socioeconomic class or status. They, that's everyone that's ever retired. Every person that worked on an assembly line, a body shop, to the presidents of companies. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Well, what I'd like to do for a minute is talk about my story, because it really lets you know how I got involved in this and, and wrote these books and, and have learned about these things. Back in the early 1980s, uh, there was this new machine that came out called microcomputer. You probably all were there with me at the time. I didn't even know what it did, but I knew I had to have one. So I bought it. And I didn't even know what to put in the machine, but I bought an, an adventure game. And I put it in the machine, and I started watching it. In about 10 minutes, I came to the realization that this machine was going to change education as we know it. That it will never be the same because of the capability of what this machine could do. So I started a company called Engineering in, in the basement of my house. Now, it wasn't very glamorous. I you know, had cinder block walls, and my administrative assistant was a 70-pound golden retriever. I had a telephone that had dial-up, and it was black, and a metal desk that I don't even know where I got it from. But I'm going to start this company, and I'm going to create education on a computer. Now, if I would have had any really good business sense, I would have quit right away. Because I was so early into the market 
People looked at me like I was insane when I would go make a sales call. They would look at me like I had lost my mind. But being the diligent person I am, I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So over the very five or six or seven lean years, and I mean lean, meaning our office was in the basement of my house in Princeton, which incidentally I violated every law, township law, for people driving in your driveway and doing business out of your house that exists anywhere. Uh, we managed the company to somehow or other to grow, and we had a breakthrough, and it was Williams Companies out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, said, we, we see what you've done, and we like it. We think there's a huge market for this in the energy business because it's so regulated, and there were so many things that go on in the energy industry that are dangerous. So you have the FDA regulations, and you have the OSHA regulations. So we decided to build a library of courses that addressed all these things so that if you were in a pump station somewhere and there was a computer available, you could just take these courses and we recorded all the scores so that um, everybody had documentation, which met the DOT regulations. We ended up with a 65% market share in the energy industry. Every possible company you can imagine, it's a big name in energy, were using our software. And then we, we saturated the market, and the revenues just plummeted. I mean, just fell out, out of bed. So William says, OK, we're kind of done. And um, so I merged the company in with another company, and I realized that the healthcare market was the market that, that we should go into. And so the company I merged with was a healthcare company. So out of uh, one of the good graces that seemed to follow me around sometimes, I uh, met somebody at the FDA, and he pulled me in the office and says, look, he said, I'm going to make you an offer. He says, I've offered this to two other people, and they've turned, two other companies, and they've turned me down. He said, what I'm offering you is a CRADA, which is a, a research and development contract, and we'll give you all the content that we have, and in return, we want you to give us all the software for free, so no money changes hands. But we'll give you the marketing rights for everything we create. I said, wait, let me, let me, let me clarify this. You mean you're going to give us all the content for, that you use to train all the inspectors and inspect one-third of the gross national product of the United States of America, every pharmaceutical company, every medical device company, and every food company, you're going to give that to us to build courseware, and all you want us to give it back to you for free and let you use it? Yeah. No money, all intellectual property. I shook my hand out and I said, done. So what happened is what you could think that happened. Our salespeople would go into a company and say, how would you like to, to license software that, that the people that are investigating your plants are using, are trained to look for? They said, well, that sounds like a good deal. And I said, um, besides that, it's all in the cloud. You don't have to do anything but just say yes. And, and here's your login number. Just tell us how many people you want to have access to this. So it was a totally scalable business. You, we could have added 1,000 customers and not had to add any employees. So two venture capital firms came cruising in, and they, owned, they bought the company, more or less just invested in it, so we had capital to grow. In 2007, we sold the company for over $100 million. The venture capital firms in New York got over a 400% return on their money in four and a half years. So here I am. I'm 63. And I said, I'm retiring. Uh, I was, I'm financially independent. I'm in good health. I had nothing to prove, nothing to do. I said, I'm going to retire. So the company gave my wife and I a trip to Italy. And we spent 10 days cruising around Italy. Very nice of them to do that, incidentally. And we came back. And slowly, over time, I began to, began to have symptoms. And I couldn't even describe them. It's hard for me to this day to describe how I felt. I was, became irritable. Um, I, I, I adopted behaviors that were unlike me, quick to anger, irritable, um, didn't find anything that interested me. Um, 
I, did, I knew exactly what I did not want to do, which was everything. <laughs> but I didn't know one thing I did want to do. I, I couldn't play golf or, or tennis because I had, had a back issue and I couldn't do that anymore. So here I was, sitting in my house, sold my company, and I had these emotional things going on. It wasn't depression. It was almost like pressure. And um, so I, I, after a while, I said, you know, I have to figure this out. I'm a psychologist. I'm a smart man. I ought to be able to figure this out. So I began doing a self-analysis. I decided to do kind of a deep dive into myself to say, I'm going to figure this out. Uh, so I, I started to do that. And um, so then I started having these revelations, like, well, maybe it's your personality type is, is an, a, a particular ingredient to this. Maybe it's a transition from the fact that you were on the fast track for 25 years where everything in the software industry moves at blazing speed. Um, the fact that you don't have that anymore. Maybe it's the fact that you, your self-identity slowly got engulfed by who you were at work and not who you were as a person. And all of these things started cascading out. And I started documenting them. So then, after I had a, these, this list, I decided I better start going out and talking to other people. Because I think maybe this is just me. Maybe I have some quirk in my personality. Maybe some weird thing, some genetic manifestation that just sort of surfaced. So the first person I wanted to talk with was a, a friend of mine who was a, the president of his company. He sold his company, and he was made president of a much larger company. He was there for a year, and they fired him. This was a guy that was the president of his high school class, the president of his class at, at the University of Pennsylvania, the number one sales guy at Beckton Dickinson, the number one everything he'd ever done. So I'm there, and we're having lunch, and I said, well, John, I said, tell me. I said, you know, you've been retired for about a year now. He said, tell me, uh, does anything sort of weird or strange happen to you? He said, yeah. He said, it's like somebody reached in my chest and pulled my heart out. <laughs> I thought, well, that's interesting. So that makes two. <laughs> so I started to continue my investigation. And I started interviewing people and talking to people and, and continuing my own self-analysis. So what we're about to learn, and I'm about to share with you, is the things that I learned along the way. And, these things are all discussed in much more detail in, in The Retiring Mind and Honey, I'm Home. But I'm going to give you the highlights because my hope is that you being aware of these things will help you as you move forward. What changes happen after retirement? What really goes on? Well, first of all, right out of the bat, there's a reduction in intellectual stimulation. I mean, you don't get as much intellectual action standing over a putt as you do figuring out complex problems <laughs> in the workplace. You just don't have the same level of intellectual stimulation. And I was used to that. I was used to in highly intense intellectual stimulation. And I went from 100 miles an hour to, to zero in a, in, a, in a matter of two weeks. I didn't know that was going to happen, but it did happen. And I kept looking for the stimulation, and it wasn't there. Reduction in social stimulation. Now, what happens when you, when you work in a job? You're around people all day long. There are teams. There are complex teams. There are group dynamics at play. There are clients. It's, you know, when you really think about it, it's, working is a fairly social activity. And one of the great things that people say when they retire, what they miss the most isn't the work. It's the people they were with. Well, bye-bye. It's not there anymore. Reduced feelings of contributing to a cause or a team. Now, this is an aspect of saying I, we, we all get our self-worth, really, by what we give, not by what we receive. So one of the great things about when, when I was working, I thought, well, 
You know, the product of what we're selling are helping people stay safe. There's a positive product of what we're doing in, in how we're helping people. And it was a very big driving element for me. Bye-bye. <laughs> More diffuse sense of identity. Well, you know, whenever you have a job, you take on a persona, you, whether you like it or not. I was the CEO, and I was the chairman of the board. I didn't even know what that meant, but other people did. <laughs> I didn't get treated the same as everyone else. I didn't know it, but I didn't. And what happens is this insidious thing happens where it slowly creeps into your very gut that you are the chairman of the board. That's who you are. Well, you're not. Retire and try to be the chairman of the board. People look at you like you're insane. An altered template for marital coexistence. Now, what happens when you retire is if you go through any type of difficulties at all, it gets magnified by all the people that are around you. You are not an island. And so it, it affects your family and primarily your spouse. And it's very interesting because um, oftentimes, I, I can share a few stories. I got, got a call with this woman who was a very dynamic person, very successful. She worked in a school system, a real go-getter. Boy, she could do anything. She had been successful in anything that she ever did. And so her husband retired three years before she did. And, and, um, and she said, I'm, I'm having a terrible problem. I said, she, I need your help. I said, well, what is it? She said, well, my husband retired three years before I did, and he's the type that's very meticulous and analytical. So he buttoned everything up. He has complete control of the house. Budgets, everything. You name it. It's, it's organized. It's scheduled. It just happens. He's got this thing nailed. She said, there's nothing for me to do. I retired this is like living in a hotel. <laughs> so I thought, boy, that's interesting. <clears throat> so then I was at Mar on Marco Island, and I was, um, I was buying a house. And this lovely uh, loan officer comes walking in. And she sits down, and you know how they make chit-chat with you before you sign your life away. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, what have you been doing since you retired? I said, ah, oh, not much. I said, I've, I've, I've written this book. It's called The Retiring Mind. She said, oh. She said, well, what's it about? I said, oh, it's about the psychological adjustment to retirement. She jumps up. She slams the door of the conference room. She says, we have to talk. <laughs> she said, my husband, a year ago, retired. He was the captain of the, of the uh, uh, fire department in Naples, Florida. She said, he's driving me crazy. He's driving me up a wall. I said, why? He said, well, he calls me in the morning. He calls me after, uh, after I have lunch. He wants to know what I had for lunch, who I went to lunch with, where I was going to go after work. She said, I can't. She said, I'm the vice president of this bank. I can't stand another minute. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, we're in, we're in counseling. She said, we're in marital counseling. She said, I, she said this is, that's how bad it is. She said, just between the two of us, she said, if this doesn't fi get fixed, I'm out of here. I only knew her for 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, my psychological skills are pretty good, but I'm not that good. <laughs> so I walked out of there, and I'm walking to the car, and I thought, well, geez, I wonder how many people are going through that. Then I realized, honey, I'm home. So I wrote this book called Honey, I'm Home, which specifically addresses the issue be between husband and wife and how to reconcile the issues that, that may, might exist as a result of retirement. So um, the need to, to uh, let me see, yeah, move on. Need to identify new points of engagement simply means, and, and we talked about it earlier, uh, sometimes it's a struggle to find your path of where are you going to engage again? How are you going to engage? And what is the meaning of that engagement to you personally? 
threats to self-esteem. Hey, I'm the chairman of the board. Oh, yeah? <laughs> you don't have your, your business persona anymore. You're just a regular human being. You're just a normal person. And all the stuff that you've gathered during your career and the images and the, the authority and everything else is a threat, to, can be a threat to your self-esteem because you say, who, I, who am I? Who, who am I? If I'm not the chairman of the board, who am I? If I'm not, if I'm not the head of XYZ, who am I? Redefine sense of identity. Shift from active to more passive lifestyle. That's a good one. For all you workaholics out there. A lot of people who are successful are not passive people. That's not in their DNA. In fact, often, the more successful they are, the more active and driven they are, the more energy they have. So when you move into something that's very, very active, and you move into something that's a rather passive existence, you can't play enough golf. You can't. Increased need for time management. Well, all you have is time. <laughs> That's your currency. In retirement, time is your currency. You choose how you're going to spend it. And that sounds like an easy thing. It's not easy because you have so much of it. And the thing is, what you're trying to do is make it meaningful. But you don't know what meaningfulness is at that stage. So you become experimental. That's what happens. And that's when growth happens. That's when growth starts. That's when the transition starts, is whenever you break out of your old mold and become experimental and trying different things. Greater dependency on investment decisions. Well, let me tell you, that is God's truth. I mean, your lifeblood is really dependent at that point in time upon the decisions you make from a financial point of view. And uh, I can't emphasize that anymore. The quality of your life after retirement depends to a great extent on the investment decisions that you make after retirement or before retirement for retirement planning. Now, there are a series of mistakes that people make. And uh, I want to talk about the first one because it's my, my core. Not being aware of the need for psychological adjustment after retirement. As I said, you may not have the need. For, for, you might go into retirement and have absolutely no issues to deal with whatsoever. And you are one of the blessed. <laughs> but the fact is that you need to be aware of the possibility that there may be an adjustment. And the great thing about uh, my situation was I was not aware of what was happening to me. I had no explanation for it because here I was, 63 years old, a psychologist, for goodness sake, and I was going through all this stuff and didn't even know what was happening to me. I didn't know. I did not have the awareness that even this, that a transition could possibly be required. And we talked to earlier, you know that the people who are retired and going through a tough time, they lie. I lied all the time. I'd be going through a tough time People say, well, hey, how, how's retirement? Ah, oh, great. Wonderful. Living a good life. Well, you, I wasn't going to say, you want to sit down on the couch and I pour my heart out for two hours, you know? <laughs> I wasn't going to do that to them. So I told a little white lie. Oh, great. So what happens is this problem exists out there and nobody knows about it. Because who's going to go out and talk about it? I sure wasn't. Making major life decisions when you're out of emotional equilibrium. I almost bought a beach house in, in, that I couldn't afford in a location I didn't like. <laughs> and only because it was, I swear, it was divine intervention. It's the only reason I didn't do it. Because I was looking for the action. I was looking to, to, to make stuff happen. And I was not in emotional equilibrium to make a major life decision like that. I had a good friend of mine. He was, he was a, uh, a CEO that retired. And he lost a quarter of a million dollars in the first four months after he retired. 
I said, what in the world did you do? He says, well, I invested in a potpourri factory down in Tennessee. I said, what do you know about potpourri? You were a healthcare executive. He said, I just needed the action. I just needed the action. So I say don't make any major life decisions for yourself for at least two years after you retire. Give yourself a little time. Sort of marinate into a new life circumstance. Taking major financial risks out of boredom or need for action, which I just discussed. Because, you know, we mentioned earlier that managing uh, income is the, or managing finances is often what the provider does. The provider is the one that put, you know, bacon on the table. Oh, yeah? Well, you, you get into a situation, you, you retire, and you're out of emo emotional equilibrium, and you start pulling, pulling the ripcord on, on different types of investments, and that's a, that's, a, that's a risky proposition. And a lot of people have lost a lot of money by doing that. Taking major, uh, assuming your marriage will not require some adjustments. Just assume that it will. If it doesn't, great. But uh, in, in the um, Honey, I'm Home, I get into this in great detail about what those adjustments are and where they come from. And I'm going I'm to demonstrate some of this to you because it is, it is interesting, but it's also kind of funny. Overestimating your self-awareness level. Now, I think a lot of times people think they know themselves better than they really do. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, if you're not a psychologist, you don't spend a lot of time working on yourself, putting yourself through exercises so that you gain greater self-awareness. You're busy. You have things to do. If you're one of those rare people that, that love to go explore things, that's one thing. But on average, people tend to think they know themselves better than they really do, which is a risk factor in retirement. And we're going to get into this a little later. Not being able to discern how you want to spend your time. They said, I knew exactly what I did not want to do, which was everything. I did not know what I wanted to do, what would give me satisfaction, because every time I ever did something that gave me pleasure, I would go out and create a company or a product. I'd invent something. The only way that I knew to do something that had value is go invent something. And when you're retired, you don't need to invent anything. I didn't need to. Not engaging in activities that enrich your spirit or creative aspirations. In retirement, you have the greatest opportunity to increase your self-awareness, to enrich your spirit, and be creative. It is unprecedented in terms of its opportunity to do that. Whether it's, in, in Princeton, there was another situation where there was a renowned architect who had, who had designed some of the biggest buildings in, in the world. And, um, of course, he was a perfectionist. And he retired, and word came back from his wife that he was absolutely miserable, and he was making her doubly miserable. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't find his path. He was going through all this stuff. He wanted to travel all the time. He never wanted to be in America. And finally, he started to paint. Now, think about it. Here he is, a renowned architect. It's not a far distance to go from being a renowned architect to painting. Well, apparently, he started painting and he was magnificent at it. And it was enriching to him. And it was just expanded him to a point where he would start showing his, his paintings and giving them away to friends and, and, and so forth. And great, he got a great deal of, of uh, self-satisfaction from that. So that's something in terms of retirement is a real opportunity. Assuming that your hobbies will sustain your interest during retirement. You know the old statement, there are more you know, uh, golf clubs in the closet of retirees than you could possibly imagine. I don't know if that's true or not, but you have to assume that maybe the hobbies that you like to do so much because you do them on the weekend won't sustain you every day. You might need to grow and, ex and expand and ad develop new interests and new things to do. Underestimating your ability, your ability to contribute to the lives of others. And this is another unprecedented thing. A lot of people talk about their grandchildren being near them. And 
uh, being involved in their life and, and, and so forth. But in any way that you can contribute to the lives of others, it is a stage of life that is enormously enriching. And one of the things that, that when I, I wrote the, these books is there's something that in that particular area I thought, well, I, could, I could, might be able to help a lot of people by doing this. And it was one of my tasks to say, okay, well, let's go do this. Overestimating your ability to manage change. You know, as you get older, you don't realize it, but your ability to manage change, change it changes. You're less flexible. Like, why would I want to do that? <laughs> right? So, uh, you have to be aware that change is, is, could be more traumatic for you. Moving from where you live could be more traumatic for you. Things in life that occur, health-wise and whatever, could be more traumatic for you than you imagine because our ability to manage change becomes a little bit more rigid as we age. Okay, now we get into the good stuff. Who's at risk? Well, I create a profile of the kinds of people that I think have the greatest risk of having these types of issues when they retire. This is not gender specific. It applies to both men and women. Those who work long hours and are successful in their careers. Now you think about that. What kind of person, from a personality point of view, works long hours and is successful? They're driven, highly energetic. Uh, they like to win. They don't shy away from competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's risk factor. Those who are highly focused and motivated. Ah. Highly focused, highly motivated. High energy, go get her. Let's make something happen today. Those who enjoy competition and winning. Those with an aggressive or assertive personality. You can start to get the profile, start to get the, the way it's laid out. Those who enjoy achieving challenging goals. Not everybody seeks out challenge. These people will. Those who seek challenges, boldness, courage. Those with few outside interests not connected to their work. See, I was very, that's one of my major failings. Because I would get up in the morning thinking about work, and I'd go to bed at night thinking about work. And nothing interested me as much as what I did for a living. And I should have been more, I should have been more broad based. But the, I had fun. I had a good time doing, running this business. And so I did not evolve myself in having all sorts of outside activities. It just it wasn't interesting enough for me. And I paid the price for that when I retired. Those whose self-identity is closely aligned with their role at work. Chairman of the board, vice president of this, director of that, most successful person, most person most likely to succeed, whoever, whatever, walk of life. Self-identity is closely aligned. Achievers tend to adopt the persona of achievement. It becomes part of their soul. It's their nature and they adopt it as their self-identity. When you retire, there's not a lot to achieve. Those accustomed to making decisions and exhibiting leadership, decision-making, decisiveness, leadership. Those accustomed to directing others regarding their roles and functions, directing others, helping them achieve, those who have received high amounts of praise and recognition for their work. You know, praise is addictive. You know that? When people get praised, what's it done? It's, it's good for their ego. It's addictive. So they want to go out and do something even more, even better. 
Because they live off the, the high of recognition and, and praise. And so, in retirement, I don't think your wife, you wake up in the morning, your wife starts praising you <laughs> for how you, you didn't throw your towel on the floor in the bathroom. <laughs> well, here's something that I think is really interesting. From a psychological point of view, this is called a Jahari window. And all of us are uh, fall into these categories. And I just want to share this with you because it, I, I put this up there because I want you to know where, where, where things surface in retirement that can harm you in some way. Quadrant one is things we know about ourselves that others know about us. That's our public self. That's, everybody knows does that. It's just open, open, everybody knows us and so forth. Quadrant two is the hidden self. Now, the hidden self, the things you know about yourself that others don't know. So, for example, if your wife makes a pot roast that her grandmother liked, and you've hated it since the day you were married, but it's your grandmother's pot roast, and you were never going to mention to her that you didn't like it, you know that, but no one else on earth knows that. That's quadrant two. Quadrant three is the blind self. Quadrant three is when things other people know about us that we do not know. And so what happens is that what we don't know about ourselves can surface and it can grab us in the most inopportune time because we don't know that it exists. And so many people who have problems in uh, retirement have things flying out of quadrant three. And they said, what in the hell is this all about? Because <laughs> it's unexpected. And then quadrant four, it's the unknown self. It's what Freud called the unconscious. The things that neither we know about ourselves and nobody else does. It's just the black hole that's part of us that's our subconscious. And of course, things from our unconscious can surface that we never knew existed. Nobody else ever knew it existed. Now, why I spend so much time on talking about self-awareness, and I, in, in these books, I go through the Enneagram to help you understand your type, because it's a, a very important thing, is because the greater self-awareness that you have, the less the unknown aspects are in number three and number four. If you were to ask me what is the single most important thing in retirement, I would tell you increase your self-awareness. Pull things out of quadrant three and put them into quadrant two and one. Because every time you know something about yourself and you, you, it's new, you gain more power over yourself. And every time you make decisions, they're better decisions because you know yourself better. It's extremely important. Well, in these books that I talk about, I use the Enneagram. And the Enneagram, does anybody in here ever hear the Enneagram? Um, a couple, couple of people. The Enneagram has a, a, a mystery to it. Uh, it, uh, it was originally mentioned by a Russian mystic by the name of Gurdjieff, who was really one strange fellow. And uh, then uh, there was a, a psychiatrist in Chile by the name of Oscar Chazo. And this is back in the 50s. He was over in the Far East, and he was traveling around, and he he apparently encountered a group of, of Sufis or whatever, and they had an oral tradition. And the oral tradition was more or less what the Enneagram is. It's the, the nature of personality. In the Enneagram, if you notice, there are nine uh, um, numbers around that, and each one is a personality type. So Claudio Naranjo, who, who was studying with, with Oscar, uh, was fascinated by this. And he put structure to the Enneagram so that you could actually determine uh, what your Enneagram was. I came in contact with this through a psychiatrist in, in San Francisco named Helen Palmer. And Helen Palmer wrote a book in the 80s, early 80s, called Enneagram. And I, I got it, and I read it, and I was completely and totally flat, you know, flabbergasted by the depth of knowledge, particularly my own self-awareness of how I came out, and it was like new information for me. And I had, in graduate school, I'd been through every possible psychological test 
imagine. I felt like a lab rat. I had been tested so much. So um, I found it fascinating, and I began studying it. And I've been studying the Enneagram for probably 30 years. And I know the Enneagram types of all my children. I know the Enneagram types of everybody that ever worked for our company. And I use that information to place, make placement decisions about what would be, where, what, where would they fit? What would give them pleasure, but where, what, where would they excel just by the, the, their exertion of their inner nature? So um, here is the nine personality types. Now, one thing I want to make clear here is that um, a person who is emotionally healthy has more of the positive aspects of the type and less of the negative aspects. And people who are unhealthy have more of the negative aspects and less of the positive ones. And as I said, in the books, I go into great detail. This is just the highest level of review. But number one is the analyzer. And the analyzer is characterized by intense focus and meticulous attention to detail. Now, if I have a brain tumor, I'm going to ask my surgeon, are you an analyzer? Because if you are, fine, go ahead and operate. <laughs> because those are the kinds of people that become surgeons and do the highly detailed, meticulous work. Positives, they're hardworking and they're disciplined. Negatives, they, they can become very judgmental and they become very inflexible. This type has a very high risk of having issues after retirement. Because one thing that underlies this type is their intensity and their judgment. And their judgment. And they can be punitive with it. Number two is the caregiver. The caregiver is characterized by giving to others. Positives are caring and supportive nature. Negatives, overly needy and manipulative. Risk level is low. A lot of people that are in nursing, education, in a lot of the help, healthing, uh, healthcare type of, of positions, they, the, the caregiver is drawn to that because they love helping other people. They get a lot of joy out of it and they feel an equilibrium when they're helping others. The star, characterized by their accomplishments. The star is typically raised in a family where accomplishing things is important. You get attention by achieving. And so, uh, Positives are achievement, motivation, and social confidence. Stars are typically raised in families that teach them how to be social. And if you ever did a trip down uh, Investment Row in Manhattan, you see a lot of threes walking around, because you can tell who they are because they have their cell phone out and they got to-do lists, that they're this long. They're workaholic types, and they're competitive, and they tend to succeed. They have a high level of risk in retirement. Four is the artist, very interesting type, uh, characterized by mood swings. Uh, positives are they're creative and expressive. Negatives are they're self-absorbed and emotional. They're the type that, that say, so glad to see you, then they'll push you away. You know, it's like they're mercurial in their emotions. And a lot of the people, if you ever uh, watch TV and you hear somebody from Hollywood say the most inane thing, that you've ever heard in your life, and I'm not going to mention share, but <laughs> if you ever hear anybody say anything that's, that's inane, just think, artist. Because they, they, just, they just function to a different rhythm and a different cadence, and they're highly emotional. The thinker, characterized by the possession and display of knowledge. Now, how you know the thinker in your company is if you're something that's extraordinarily complex and nobody can figure it out, you go to this person that knows the answer. And they wouldn't even say, how did you know that? They said, well, I just know it. They, they spend all their time analyzing, studying, and mastering things. <coughs> and they, they can be worth their weight in gold because they're the ones that often come up with innovations in technology companies and new ways of doing things. Uh, they have their analytical and mastery of complex concepts. Negatives, they can be detached and alone. And I, I was talking uh, uh, last night, and I said, well, that, that's my type. I said, one of the things that I can do is I can go into a room and be interested in a project, like writing my book or whatever, 
and I can be I can be in there for weeks. My wife wants to you know send food up, you know, <laughs> because I I really don't need to have a lot of social contact when I'm really focused on something like that. Uh, six is the contributor, characterized by loyalty and a cynical nature. Now, in an organization, if you want to know what bad something could happen that would be bad, go to, go to number six because he already knows what what what. Could, you know, I always say that a six, when they smell flowers, they look around for the hearse. <laughs> Positives are responsible and loyal. The organizations are built on top of the contributor. They hold organizations up. They're the stuff that holds it together. Their negatives are they worry a lot and they're doubtful. They're positives, they're responsible, and they're loyal. They'll work for a company for 30 years. You treat them fairly and they'll work and be there and be happy and contribute every single day. The networker, characterized by interpersonal skills. A networker is really easy to, to identify because they always have stuff buzzing around them. They always have people around them. My daughter is a seven. She said, I, I can't stand this neighborhood. I, I said, why? She says, everybody sends their kids over here. It's like a big party all the time. I said, well, yeah. <laughs> a, a seven is a networker. They, they are great in sales. They are great in, in uh, doing things that involve uh, inf influencing other people. The negatives, the positive, social and adventurous. They're very adventurous. They'll do almost anything. They'll go anywhere. They'll, they'll go on treks. They'll, you know, there's nothing that they won't try. The negatives are that they're a little bit scattered, and they have a rebellious streak in them. And that's very important. You'll spot that later. The leader is characterized by a forceful nature. Positives, direct and assertive. The negatives are insensitive and excessive. Their risk level is very high in retirement. I'll never forget, I was doing some research for Honey, I'm Home, and I, I realized that there were two people who were married, and they were both eights. Now, an eight can have a confrontation with somebody that it would make any other type cringe, and an eight could just, just, just have this kind of converse, confrontation and be in total equilibrium, like that means nothing. A friend of mine was telling me he, he went to this house, and it was a dinner party, and the husband and wife were both eights. And they got into an argument over dinner. He said it was the most knocked down, dragged out. He said, I thought they were going to have a divorce. He said, I, so I was convinced at the end of dinner they were going to have a divorce. That's how vicious it became. And there was another party there. And, and this person was just, I, I can't believe what I just saw. And she said, oh, no, they're always that way. <laughs> they get over it. it. means nothing. Both of them are eights. So the thing that I want to show you here, just as an example, just so you know how I use this in, in uh, relationships. You see the networker, the negative scattered and rebellious? Well, the person that I, that closed the door in the conference room was a seven. And she was married to an analyzer. So an analyzer, control, a seven, adventure, and rebelliousness. I'm out of here. If he doesn't straighten up, I'm out of here. You see how it works in relationships? <coughs> so what happens in marriages after retirement, all these activities are in play. All of the configurations of your anagram types and the compatibilities and incompatibilities that exist between the types built into the very essence of your personalities are in play. And the more time you spend together with your spouses in retirement, the more that those incompatibilities surface and become irritated and can flare up. And so knowing these things and, and Understanding the configurations and combinations of what happens in a relationship when you have various types of Enneagram types in play is very, very helpful. Well, here are the two books. Uh, the website is theretiringmind.com. 
Uh, you can, you're welcome to come on the site. You can read the first two chapters of either book, decide whether you think it would be worthwhile or not. And behind, in the back of each book is an Enneagram survey, so if you're interested in your, uh, knowing what your Enneagram is or in, you know, uh, getting into that a little bit, you're welcome to do that. Parting words. It's not what we have, but what we enjoy that constitutes our abundance. Epicurious. That's it, folks. So how do you create peace and balance when you have a different personality type? Um, in the, this is a great question. In the Honey, I'm Home, every permutation combination of the types are, are uh, identified and the typical types of conflicts that could arise between the two are discussed, and recommendations are provided of how to reconcile those differences between the, that particular type. In other words, the, it, it, the architecture of the relationship generates the type of con potential conflict that could occur, and it t talks about things to do to, to how to resolve those issues, and uh, it's, a, it's a complex process to describe, but it's because it's, it's individual for every co combination. But uh, that's how I, I would start. Next question is, is this similar to the strength finder test? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think so. I think it's different. The, 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 if I understand the strength finders test, the Enneagram is primarily designed for self-awareness, increasing self-awareness. It is not focused so much on what you should be doing, but it's what you are. <laughs> this is great. Uh, this is a question that I might ask. Uh, is it possible to enjoy retirement without retiring? <laughs> well, if you retire on the job, I guess. <laughs> um, enjoy retirement without retiring. Well, let me see if I understand the question. Somebody else in the family has retired, and they've created a retirement lifestyle while the person ha lives in a retirement lifestyle but still works. If that's the only way I can interpret it. I don't see any reason why not. I, I see no reason why not. Isn't that what you're doing, really? What I'm doing? Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. <laughs> I have to work on my self-awareness. <laughs> but um, I, I, I guess uh, the, what I do is sort of comes in spurts. And um, so um, I just sort of go where I'm led. I don't try to do anything that, that I'm not called to do. So I feel retired right now, actually. <laughs> what causes me stress would have caused me stress whether I retired or not. So mm -hmm. how do you, do you filter that out? Well, I think there, there are a lot of of circumstances that happen, like ill health or, or, or something that just makes you just unhappy. And it, be, it makes you unhappy whether you're working or retired or whatever. Um, and I, I think it's simply a life circumstance you have to deal with. I don't think it should be categorized as an issue associated with retirement so much. But I'll give you the, the alternative to that. Let's just say that you retired and, and you were forced to retire. You didn't have enough money and now you're, you're, you're living and you, don't, you barely have enough money to survive on and it makes you extraordinarily unhappy and you're living that unhappiness constantly in retirement. And that's a terrible thing and there are so many people in that circumstance. What were the things that you changed in your own situation that helped you enjoy your own retirement? Um, when I studied the, the anagram, I went into a really deep analysis of it. I, I probably read 15 or 20 books and uh, really contemplated it deeply in terms of what it meant. And in the process of doing that, I contemplated deeply what it meant for me because I was a thinker and a thinker has a tendency to sort of withdraw, a tendency not to involve other people in, in the, circ the circle of activities and so forth. And what happened to me was is that I, when I came to the realization that there were some aspects of of the thinker type and me personally that I didn't like. That I, I thought I had, more to, more, I had more to give other people if I stepped out. 
and overcame some of the limitations that, that number five thinker provided. So what happened was is that here I am, I'm talking to you, uh, and this is probably not a typical thing a five would ever do. So what you're witnessing here is simply the growth manifestation of me as a result of studying the Enneagram and really trying to change aspects of myself and taking more chances and more risks and doing things that would challenge me and, and be uncomfortable. I'm not uncomfortable anymore, but I used to be. <laughs> Are you happier when you deal with stress? Um, well, when I was working, I had a tremendous amount of stress um, because fortunately, we sold the company before 2008. <laughs> it would have been a lot more stressful if we would have waited another year. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, selling a company is very difficult. I didn't realize how difficult it was. We, we had compound annual growth of 35% a year for five years in a row. And we set uh, investment books out to, to 50 companies, and we came down to the last one before they bought it. That's stress. So I think that I, at this point in time, I like not having that much stress. But was I more productive? Absolutely. Stress is a great motivator. <laughs> the anagram had arrows connecting some numbers to the others. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Okay. In the anagram, there's something called a moving number. And it means that you're moving toward that. If you, if you evolve yourself, your type, you tend to move in the direction of the arrow, to the, the other, toward uh, uh, developing attributes of the other type. That's what it means. I, I understand. Yeah. I understand the question. What I think you're saying, let me restate it and see if I understand it. Okay. That sometimes you're a one, sometimes you're a six, sometimes you're a nine, depending on the circumstances. Yes. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you that you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you are one type, and that's your driving uh, uh, inner self is a type. What you do is you have the ability to be flexible and become temporarily other types for situational dynamics. But if you really got to know you, very, very well, and really understood what you liked and disliked and what you really were like, you're one of those types. That's the truth. You're the one of the types. If you're actually being self-aware and you're moving toward another point, I mean, theoretically, would you start to move and change around your personality type? I don't think so. I, I think that you always retain your core personality type. The, the, the intrinsic nature of your type stays with you forever. And the reason for that is, is that, well, how did you get the type? Well, you got the type probably because of combination, but in your early childhood, you chose a way of being which optimized your family circumstances. Here you are little, and you're in, with powerful people called your parents. So oftentimes what your parents uh, reinforce, you become. You adopt that as your pattern. So if you're, let's say you're a three, you're the star, your parents would reward you for achievement, reward you for being charming or, or social or whatever. And so you adapt that as your style, and it becomes intrinsic. Now, there's a, a, a part of that is also genetic. I think if, if a person is, uh, has a gene, genealogical code in the DNA to be very, very shy, okay, then the possibility is, is they would not become the star because they would be too uncomfortable. They would, tr they would adapt another type, but they would try to manage that. Uh, if you, if you, um, you look at each type, in, in the book I talk about how the types got created. And, and they're created very early in life. And they're, they get adopted as a core aspect of how you see yourself moving through life. This is what you do. This is how you are. And every one of the types had different environments. In, when they were very small, and also they had different genetic aptitudes which manifested themselves. So it's sort of a combination. I don't know what percentage is what or what, but that's the mix that creates the type. And that's why it's very difficult to change it in a dramatic way because it's a core part of yourself. And which book speaks more to that? Um, they both sort of do. One, one in terms of your psychological adjustment, retiring mind, and then the other one in terms of multifaceted aspects of it.
Dr. Delamontagne has agreed to stick around afterwards and visit and answer questions on an individual basis if you, uh, you know, if you have some follow-up questions and such that you would like to ask him. Um, and I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Delamontagne, for uh, joining us today.